Disclaimer. The footage shown in this documentary has been obtained by fans, and in many situations has been only shared in confidence. Japanese copyright laws are very strict, with TV networks being at liberty to remove footage on video websites often within a few days. As such, let it be known that neither I nor anyone in this project cannot share footage beyond what is shown here in this documentary. Not won't, can't. And anyone asking for footage in the comments will be restricted from commenting. Thank you. Isn't nostalgia just the best? You get a warm and fuzzy feeling inside for a bygone era of a TV show that you adore. That could always be the case for G4's old Sasuke earrings, or even American Ninja Warrior at its core. But what happens if a show remains relatively unknown to the larger public eye? What happens if a show is never syndicated outside of its native country? If a tree falls down in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it really make a sound? For many TV shows, this unfortunate reality is all too real. For one show in particular, this has been a reality for which most fans in the West aren't even aware of. That show's name... ...is Sportsman Number One. understand where this story starts, what if we turn back the clock just a little bit? Maybe let's change the lens from which we look at Tokyo Broadcasting System's work. What do we get? And stop. I think there's a show to talk about now, but what is it about? Where does it start? It all started, as all TV shows do, with a piece of paper. Sportsman No. 1 was originally pitched by Ushio Higuchi as King of Sports in 1990, with the theory of deciding who would be the best at a simple athletic meet or school field day. The executives liked it, but couldn't do it because they thought it would interfere with the competitors' schedules and thought it would be too dangerous for them to try to risk. As we all know, 30 years later, Higuchi does not know what safety is. So he didn't give up, and he asked again in the autumn, three years later. Only this time, they did agree to it, ordering a special at the end of the year. And so, a legend was born. Pro Sportsman 1993 took place on the 21st of December 1993 at the Tokyo 
Metropolitan Gymnasium in Shibuya, which had also housed events in both the Tokyo Olympics and has been a gymnastics hotspot for decades, with a whopping 28 competitors. When would it air? Exactly 30 years ago, as of the date of this video, the 29th of December, 1993. The tournament was broken down into five events, which I will quickly explain. It began with the Goju Mitoro So, but we know it better as the 50 meter dash, a familiar event in athletic meets. Likely because all 28 were competing in this event, it had a whopping 7 lanes compared to the 4 we'd see in future tournaments. The matchups and format, if there even was one, are unknown, but it is known that compared to later tournaments, it started with the competitors introducing themselves rather than the announcers introducing them. Nonetheless, with a time of 6.61 seconds, ultimately baseball infielder Yukio Tanaka would be the number one of this event, and would set the stage for future events. Next, we saw an event only referred to as Ikinokori Uderate Muze. Though it's better known as the final push-up today, the name literally translates to survival push-ups. Simply put, the event involves repeatedly performing push-ups to the beat of a taiko drum. If you went out of rhythm, or your body touched the floor, you were out. It's a simple event, but also it becomes much more taxing as the event goes on. It later became a pretty involved event in the early days of Kenneku Banzuke. This 16-year-old kayaker got 1,200 push-ups before stopping in the season finale of this show's pilot. For safety reasons though, in this rendition of the event, the maximum amount of push-ups before automatically crowning everyone remaining the number one would be 300. Ultimately, that cap would not be reached, with professional wrestler Takeda Nobuhiko the number one stopping at 211 push-ups. At this point, Yukio Ikitani was ahead with 52 points just a few points more than those below him. But the next event would be where that would all change. After that, we got to an event known as Tobi Bako. For those unfamiliar with Japanese school gyms, they traditionally have what is called a Tobi Bako, or vaulting horse as it's translated. Simply put, it's an event involving a springboard, using it to vault over an increasingly taller, trapezoidal shaped block using only your hands. We started on 8 boxes, 1 meters 50 centimeters, and in the end, the competitors vastly outperformed what the producers had anticipated. When Higuchi was deciding how high to build the vaulting box, 10 boxes was thrown out, 15 boxes was mentioned, but they decided that no one would be able to do 12 boxes. So they set the limit at 13, 2 meters. Rehearsals seem to prove this as they use many members of staff to test it out, and no one could clear 10 boxes. However, out of the 18 that attempted it, 13 were able to clear 12 boxes, which is 1 meter 90 centimeters. And 8 of those, out of those 13, were able to clear the maximum 13 boxes, which is 2 meters. Not knowing what to do and not wanting 8 winners, they decided to add a 10 centimeter block to the box to be the final box for safety reasons. Ultimately, gymnast Yukio Ikitani and baseball infielder Atsushi Kataoka were the joint number one of this event doing what was referred to as 13 boxes plus 10 centimeters. This brought Ikitani up to 80 points, with pro wrestler Kiyoshi Tamura trailing him by 15 points. But things would soon change. The next event was called 1v1 Sunahiki, 
literally translated as 1v1 tug of war. Simply put, as the name implies, it was a game of one-on-one -on -one tug of war. This edition of this event was simply held on the venue's floor with the winner of each round being dictated by the lines demarcated on the floor. According to the book, it was expected that pro wrestlers would have a head in this due to their power, but by round two, all of the wrestlers had been defeated. Simplicity aside, the number one of this event was also Yukio Tanaka, taking the overall lead and forcing wrestler Nobuhiko Takeda into a tie with Yukio Ikitani just in time for the final event. Finally, there was an event called Survival Race, the only event that was referred to with English wording in name in this tournament. Needless to say, it made its sole appearance in this tournament, but what the event featured was not unlike what you would have seen at a primitive Sasuke or Ninja Warrior course. Wall climbs, balance beams, rope climbs, a time trial all within a 160 meter track. Failure to be quick would mean a DNF, which would also mean no points. Nonetheless, all 28 entered, and only 14 could complete the course in time, with the other 14 all failing at the final rope climb. Since gymnast Yukio Ikitani did it the fastest, he was crowned the number one for this event. Whether this foreshadowed his future mild success in Sasuke, you be the judge. As for the points, it wasn't enough for Yukio Ikitani to take the overall title, as Yukio Tanaka took 6th place in the event, and that was enough for him to be the first to take the title of number 1 with a grand total of 138 points. Though 1994 would technically not have a sportsman, it would return on New Year's Day 1995, though retroactively referred to as Pro Sportsman 1995. In this tournament, it was referred to as Sportsman No. 1 Decisive Battle 2. Taped on the 23rd of December 1994 in the Tokyo Bay NK Hall, name sound familiar? Pro 1995 would include many familiar faces, both now and then, such as Yakult Swallows' outfielder Tetsuya Ida. Forward for Verity Kawasaki Nobuhiro Takeda, and returning runner-up Yukio Ikitani to name a few. Also, it's important to note that despite us calling the first tournament Pro 1993 for consistency's sake, this tournament is the first actual professional tournament. It's to the point where it's literally in the logo. The day's first event would be named the Bamba, which is based off the Bane Kyoso horse racing in Japan. They would start with a single log weighing 200 kilograms. Yeah, needless to say, when this event was being tested, only one person in production could do the event. And he weighed over 100 kilograms and did judo. No coincidence, I'd imagine. By the time we reached the semi-finals, they added Another log, which is also 200 kilograms, may I add, to the competitor's sleds. They would compensate for this by reducing the distance required to pull the sled by 5 meters. But it was still an arduous task regardless. By the final match, it would come down to Kazuhiro Kiyohara versus Makoto Sasaki. For some reason, they added another log, which adds the total weight of the sled to 600 kilograms. For reference, that's more than this, and 12 of these. It really comes off as no surprise then that the finals would be quite the struggle even with the distance required only being about 5 meters. For the first 30 seconds of the match, they stayed pretty close, about neck and neck, about 2.5 meters in, I know. Sasaki gained a pretty steady lead, perhaps finding a more efficient way to pull the sled. It's important to note that the time limit for these matches was 2 minutes. 
and by the 42nd mark, Kiyohara had reached his limit. Perhaps this was simply 200 kilograms too much for the baseball infielder. Eventually, Sasaki would cross the finish line after a minute and a half of fierce struggling, which meant that he stood as the winner of the event, which put him in the early lead. How long would this last? Only time would tell. Next was a new event called Power Force, where competitors would have to stand next to each other connected by a bungee cord and make a run to the button on their side once the starting signal goes off. The twist is that the bungee cord is shorter than the distance required, meaning if you want to win, you must pull your opponent. This initial version is also different from its later counterparts as you are literally able to grab onto the mats to pull yourself to the button, which essentially almost trivializes the difficulty. This event was also different as it trivialized the sportsman part of the show, with competitors hitting the button with their foot, with their heads, sometimes even making their own opponent hit the button for them. If certain people saw this and were still in the community, I don't think they'd be too impressed. Nonetheless, you came for the results, right? The final match featured Naoyuki Naito and Katsumi Hirosawa. On the starting signal, they dashed towards the button, but hit it and passed rather quickly. After a minute or two of literally just grabbing onto the mat and pulling, Naito takes the win, taking him to the top of the leaderboard. From there, we move on to the familiar horse box, continuing the theme of name changes, though this event still doesn't have the name we all know it for. Because of last time's attempts ending with a quarter of the entire field being just a bit too good than the producers had expected, they built the monster box all the way up to 18 boxes, just to be sure. Although the competitors had learned from last time, we certainly did not make it past the first few levels without incident. For every failure though, there were a few good eggs as six competitors were able to beat 14 boxes and make it to uncharted territory. Two meters, 26 centimeters, just about the height of a phone box. Something important to note is that competitors only get one attempt per level. Failure on any level means your run is over. From there, three were able to get to 16 boxes, in which there were two clears. Tetsuya Ida. And Yukio Ikitani. We were getting dangerously close to the 18 box cap. Unfortunately, neither were able to clear 17 boxes, but a new record was set nonetheless. This brought Ida up from 9th to 5th place, Ikitani from 12th to 8th place. In the end, Naito was still in the lead by a comfortable 30 points. It's also important to point out as a little side note that the special had these kinds of fluff pieces featuring Ida and Satake doing challenges, similarly to how Banzuke would be six months later. Pretty intense stuff. The fourth challenge was the Tug of War, returning from Pro 1993. This event was shown in a fast-forward format, so not much is known. It seems they simply sunk too much time into Power Force. In the end, the final matchup included Katsumi Hirosawa, and Yoshiaki Fujiwara. Fujiwara did have an 8kg edge over Hirosawa, as well as being a wrestler which you think would give him a power edge. On the other hand, Hirosawa is also 15 years younger than Fujiwara, and also hasn't been attacked by a living bear. 
Wait, look, wait, look. When push came to shove, Fujiwara slipped, and Hirosawa gained the upper hand rather quickly, winning the event. This would bring him up to second place, just behind Naito by 15 points. Next up is another returning event, the 50 meter dash. Though the way it's portrayed here is a bit different, being the aforementioned 4 lane track as opposed to the 7 in Pro 1993. The rules themselves though remained essentially identical. This tournament though showed the photo finish process, as you can see it's pretty rigorous. It's honestly shocking we would hardly ever see this in future tournaments. Format wise, the qualifiers would have 4 people per race, where the winner in each race would advance. After this, the winners of the 4 races would go to semis, where they'd race in groups of 2. Then the winners of that would duke it out for the win in the finals. Pretty simple stuff. The first race wouldn't have much to write home about, as soccer player Takafumi Ogura gained a pretty quick lead of half a second, which is huge for these kinds of races. The next race had a pretty strange lineup, as Naito and Fujiwara, the arguable powerhouses in this competition, went against the two speed athletes, evidently. Unfortunately, only one athlete could advance, and it was Nobuhiro Takeda who crossed the finish line first, with Fujiwara trailing in fourth by over 1.5 seconds. Though, that's better than what we get in the third race. On the starting signal, there was actually a race going on, as Makoto Sasaki and Hideki Nagai were neck and neck. Here we saw the photo finish hardware hard at work. For those curious, Nishi refers to the brand that was presumably sponsoring this competition. Yes, even in 1995, these shows were still getting sponsors. By a margin of six hundredths of a second, Sasaki beat out the guy, giving us an interesting race. Funnily enough, fourth place Yoshinori Abe didn't even cross the finish line at all, which is hilarious because crossing the finish line at all gives you 5 points, which Abe clearly didn't want here or even in the Bomba where he did the exact same thing. Food for thought, I suppose. Finally, the fourth and final race of the qualifiers wasn't all too special, as Tetsuya Ida hauled to the race quite comfortably, finishing with a time of 6.29 seconds on the clock. By the semis, four athletes remained and both matches were quick and clear cut. In the first semis match, which funnily enough pitted two teammates of the same Japanese national football team against one another, from the starting signal, noble hero Takeda quickly began to gain a lead and won by over 0.3 seconds. In the second semis race, both competitors were fit to win, but Ida clearly showed off his running prowess, even slowing down by the finish line, as if he were holding back. In the end, the finals match would be between Tetsuya Ida and Nobuhiro Takeda. And thus, both competitors stood before their starting blocks. Soccer versus baseball. After the starting signal went off, both were off to a blazing start. They were neck and neck even upon the competitors crossing the finish line. It was too close to call for production. So they checked the cameras, and by a margin of five hundredths of a second, Ida was crowned the winner of the event. This shot him up to third on the leaderboard, placing him within 20 points of first place, which was still Naoyuki Naito. Tired of me mentioning returning events? This next one is no exception. Survival Push-Ups returns nearly identically, at least rule-wise, under a new name. The more well-known name, the Final Push-Up as a result of there being more footage that survives than a two second clip this is the first time we get to see it truly play out a small detail you may have noticed is that the interval between push-ups this time around appears to be much longer this event is going to be much harder 
Upon the first push-ups, well, these certainly are push-ups, despite obvious compromises being made in these push-ups, competitors began to drop out quickly by the 15 push-up mark, one by one. Yeah, it's obvious why the Banzuke setup was the way it was. Even with the restrictive blocks, there was no safety limit for Banzuke. Once we hit the 70 push-up mark, however, we hit a standstill with 6 athletes left. Eventually, three of them would drop out around the 100 mark, and then there was three. Yukio Ikitani, Masaki Satake, and Yutaka Akita. The event had lapsed 12 minutes and everyone still seemed pretty solid. Or well, about as solid as this can look anyway. Nobuhiko's record of 211 push-ups flew by like it was no problem. At this point, the goal was to hit the safety limit of 300, which again, would crown everyone who remained by that point as the number one. By the 15 minute mark, you could clearly see the agony on their faces, but they clearly had much more to give. Eventually, and I do mean eventually, the end would come. In the end, it was a three-way tie for the number one. You can just see the relief on their faces. By this point, Naito had finally been bumped off the top of the leaderboard, not even having done this event. There was a new leader now, Takafumi Ogura. But it wasn't a done deal yet. Anyone in the top eight could very well snag the win. And there's one event left. Our final event would be one that deviates from the norm of modern sportsmen, Beach Flags. Funnily enough, the song in the intro of this event might just be a tad familiar. The event is done by sticking a few flags in the mats in a row. Competitors lie down, facing away from the flags. Upon the starting signal, competitors turn around to grab a flag. Of course, there are less flags than competitors, which is what makes this interesting. Sound familiar? That's because it is, mainly due to its prominence later in the show. Usually you're used to seeing this event at the start, right? Usually the first event? Well, this tournament had this classic event as the final event. It's a little different from what we know it as now. Four people on a small mat trying to catch two small flags on the other end 15 meters away. Funnily enough, it would go on to make an appearance in Kinikubatsuke, as shown in this clip. While that may seem rather boring, especially with the downsized heat, it wouldn't take long for things to heat up. It quickly, seemingly, became obvious who were going to be the leaders in this pack. As some of these athletes were seemingly built for this event, though this clearly wasn't an end-all. A rookie mistake. Ogura had a powerful lead, but he had fumbled the flag. It was an incredibly fatal error at the last opportunity, as this allowed fellow competitor Nayoyuki Naito to grab a flag perfect opportunity to take the lead back. By the start of round two, eight athletes remained. In the first heat, 
Yukio and Nobuhiro once again cruise through the heat by a sizable margin, seemingly having an easy matchup. In the second heat, we'd have quite the match. With a body slam, Ida and soccer player Yutaka Akita would clutch a spot in the quarterfinals. By the time we reach quarterfinals, a mere four athletes remain. Tetsuya Ida, Yukio Ikitani, Nobuhiro Takeda, and Yutaka Akita. As you can see, there's quite the correlation between being a good runner and doing well in this event. Quickly, Akita found himself outmatched and was the one without a flag in the end, leaving the rest for the semi-finals. Unfortunately for Nobuhiro, he tripped nearly instantly being left in the dust by Ida and Yukio. And now we have our final two. Winner takes all. いよいよファイナルバトル天王山を迎えました。さあ、いよいよ。初手の位置についていただきましょう。池谷か飯田か。冷たいマットに身を伏せている時、2人はどんな心境でしょうか。一体何を見ているのか。反対方向を見つめている
some form, as this was common practice in future tournaments. The competition would be pretty fierce though, as there were, interestingly, 25 competitors in this tournament spread amongst the 6 events. For reference, Pro 1995 had 16. Unlike Pro 1993, however, which had a similar crowd size, we have a few familiar faces in the crowd, as we'll see soon. Starting out this tournament is a new event called the Kensui, which literally translates to the pole. Yep, it doesn't get any more literal than this. You may be led to believe that it'd be similar to the Bansuke event Pump Up, which was a glorified quick muscle just with pull-ups, but you'd be wrong. From what I can gather, it was done similarly to the final push-up, with competitors doing pull-ups to the beat of a taiko drum. If you dropped, or you gassed out, you were eliminated. This obviously would make it much harder. It was pretty evident in the results where only 5 athletes made it past the 20 pull-up mark. Shogi player Shinya Yamamoto apparently stopped after just two pull-ups, which was just absurd. After just 64 pull-ups, Yukio Ikitani, who's becoming a bit of a familiar face at this point, pulled out. With just 71 pull-ups, Rings Gymnastics champion Jotaro Nagayama was the number one. Up next is Power Force, a familiar event by this point, and here's a fine example of the books being very bare bones in its recollection. This is all you get in terms of results. Pretty empty, isn't it? In the end, we had future Olympic hammer thrower Koji Morofushi face off against a fellow Olympian, volleyball player Masayuki Izumikawa. And ultimately, Izumikawa was the one who reigned supreme. After that, we would see the staple event Monster Box make its appearance here and finally under its iconic name this time. Would the 23 people in attendance at this event manage to pull their weight? Notably, we'd see Olympic medalist Vitaly Sherbo and Yukio's younger brother Naoki Ikitani make their first appearances here. As a matter of fact, Yukio was, at the time, the more popular brother. They essentially bring Naoki in to incite some sibling rivalry. Nonetheless, with more gymnasts competing, it'd be very interesting. Well, right off the bat, we'd have a much better start. So far, so good, right? And then Vitaly attempted 10 boxes and he effortlessly soared over the box. Vitaly was making a statement. He came to win. The finer details from there are mostly lost other than this wicked fail from none other than Katsuhide Torisawa. Yes, really, he was in his late 20s at the time. In general, the results were much stronger this time, and the field had seemingly learned from their mistakes. By the time we made it past the world record of 16 boxes, a whopping 7 athletes remained. Something notable to mention is that after the 16 box mark, competitors would be allowed to have a retry. Though in a feat unheard of thus far, all 7 of them would break the record. This included Power Force runner-up Koji Murobushi, both Ikitani brothers, which also means Yukio got a new personal best, and Vitaly. Unfortunately, by 19 boxes, everyone's luck had begun to dry out. Yukio and Naoki had both met their match, but one man still stood, and that was none other than Vitaly. He ran, and he flew over the box without incident. You would think that's where he would stop. But he wasn't done for the day. He decided to go one higher and go for 20 boxes. The victory was already his. This was just about bettering the world record. 
もうあとは記録に挑むのみビタリーセルボ 2m76cm <笑> Once again it was a perfect landing In the end the record was his and it was only his And thus we move on to the next event Beach Flags returns, and yet again, not really a ton to go off here. Similarly to Power Force, you only got so much information because the book's retelling of the events was shoddy at best. It is just barely more specific about the results than Power Force, but by a very thin margin. Ultimately, Yukio Kitani was knocked out in the semifinals. Which meant that it would come down to Yasutoshi Kujirai versus Takahiro Wada. And in the end, Yasutoshi would reign supreme. Sound familiar? That's because Yasutoshi Kujirai was in Sasuke 3 to 5. It's a small world when you're talking about these kinds of jointly owned TVS shows. We have another endurance survival event on our hands in the form of the final sit up. If it wasn't obvious, this was a sister event to the final push up. Nearly five months from the air date of this tournament, it'd make its inaugural appearance in Kenneku Banzuke's initial pilot run, not long after the show got off the ground. We'll talk about that later. Unlike the final sit up we'd see here, Banzuke's final sit up was conducted on flat ground. Sportsman's event was at an upward incline, making this much harder. Just like the final push up in Pro 1993's Toei Bako, a safety limit of 500 reps would be enforced. This, once again, prematurely ending the event should the cap be reached. However, for what it's worth, it seems like the competition was actually pretty tense, as competitors dropped out at pretty regular intervals. The safety limit was pretty close to being hit, but in the end, wrestler Masanori Toita dropped out at 462 sit ups, less than 40 away from that special limit. But that doesn't matter. He had already won the event. Interestingly, the final event was the Tug of War, an unorthodox ending event, but that's only when you consider this tournament a sequential leaderboard tournament, which it's not. Once again, a lot of info is unknown, so let's round this out with the final match Koji Murafushi, again, versus football player Ryusuke Tomozo. When the match was said and done, Ryusuke came out on top and was the final person to be crowned a winner in an event. A few times so far, I've mentioned Kiniku Banzuke. For those who may not know, Kiniku Banzuke, also known as Unbeatable Banzuke internationally, was another athletic competition show that aired on TBS. Following the unexpected success of the first sportsman tournaments, TBS wanted to fast track more content in the series. Their answer to this was to launch a late night pilot series in July of 1995. Known as Kenniku Banzuke. The title, in a literal sense, means muscle ranking, and that is ultimately what the main goal of both Sportsman and Banzuke was. In Banzuke, members of the general public could show up to local events held across nearly every region of Japan and compete in events seen on Sportsman No. 1, such as the final push up. Those who fared the best would then come back to TBS's main studio and compete in a super sized finale, styled in the same way as Sportsman itself. The show featured the same staff and main announcer, Ichiru Furutachi, as Sportsman, as well as the same Greco Roman set design. 
To TBS's surprise, Kiniku Banzuke was receiving huge viewership despite airing at 1.15 a.m. Japanese Standard Time. TBS had believed that the appeal of this sort of athletic show was relatively limited to athletic adult men. However, this was not the case at all. Many friends and family flocked to see the people they know compete. Many others were enticed by the public competition. As very few TV shows in Japan allow members of the public to compete, due to the strict identity protection laws. This buzz around Banzuke only helped to further build up the Sportsman number 1 brand, as viewers looked forward to the main event so they could see their favorite professional athletes compete. About six months later, Amateur Sportsman would return for its second installment. The rules were basically identical, though only two competitors, Yukio Ikitani and Masanori Toita, would return. No idea why them specifically, considering there were over a dozen people that placed in the top three in Amateur One's events. But that's neither here nor there. Entering the Coliseum was a whopping 23 athletes split amongst five separate events, making this quite a party for a sportsman tournament. Again, not much footage is available, so I'll have to make this part of the video somewhat brief. We begin with an old friend, Beach Flags. 16 competitors would face off into four groups, each vying for two flags. Among this roster were Speed Skater, Hiroyasu Shimizu, and Yukio Ikitani, who was the runner-up in this event in the Pro Tournaments. Both made it out of their respective heats and into the quarterfinals, who joined another speed skater, Yasunori Miyabe, and soccer player Tomohito Kobayashi. In the quarterfinals, the first two were Ikitani and Shimizu, but Kobayashi was just out of reach, which moved Miyabe up to the semi-final round. In the semis, it was everyone versus Ikitani. Ikitani was put in the middle so he would be on the attack instead of the defense. Ikitani planned to go for Shimizu's flag, but he caught up very quickly, meaning he had to switch course and go for Miyabe's flag. This knocked out Miyabe, and it was Ikitani versus Shimizu in the final. Would Ikitani avenge himself and win against the amateur athletes? No. Shimizu jumped for it first. Shimizu had the edge from the starting whistle and was able to continue it from there, which means your number one is speed skater Hiroyasu Shimizu. The tug of war is where we meet another familiar face, Olympic judoka Hidehiku Yoshida, weighing in at 86 kilograms, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that he dominated the field in earlier rounds. Other than that, however, Yasunori Miyabe would fall victim to Olympic wrestler Akira Ota in round 2. Despite avenging his brother Yuki Nori in round 1, who was also taken out by Ota, Olympic speed skater Junichi Inui also was taken out in round 2, being taken out by, you guessed it, Yoshida. Into the semifinals, it was Hidehiko Yoshida versus Olympic speed skater Toshiyuki Kuro Iwa, and Kira Oda versus Masami Kimura, who was involved with yachts, I guess. First was Yoshida versus Kuro Iwa. A medalist battle for the ages, which actually ended pretty quickly. It was Yoshida in one full swoop. Oda vs. Kimura. Wrestler vs. Yacht. Oda seemed to have issues at the start, but eventually Kimura couldn't really move, which gave Ota the win. This left silver medalist Yoshida to face off against gold medalist Ota in the finals. It's been a runaway for Yoshida the entire event, but can Ota manage to get the upper hand in this gold medal match? 
the whistle blows, and both became basically immovable. But then Ota pulls Yoshida down, taking the number one spot. Not much in-depth information is actually given about Power Force, just like last tournament. The two who would make their ways to the finals round were Yokoyama and Kimura, a wrestler and a Yacht Club member. Both were around the same height, but Kimura had the edge in just being a couple of inches taller. Kimura had the strategy of leaving it to his lower body, and it seemed to work, as in an instant, Kimura was able to get to the button. Masami Kimura was your number one in Power Force. Back in the spring, the endurance event known as the Final Sit-Up was introduced. A survival-style sit-up competition based off what was done in the pro contest at the start of the year. 20 people participated 6 months ago, but one person stood on top. Masanori Toyita. He was able to do an incredible 462 sit-ups. But he wanted to do more this time, so he returned to defend his title. Unlike last tournament, there were only 12 contenders in the sit-up competition, but there were some big names. Akira Ota was the first one knocked out, only mustering the strength to do 42 sit-ups. Next was Yoshida at 99, and not long after was Yasunori Miyabe at 108. By the time they had reached 200 sit-ups, the point where you really start to struggle, only half the field remained. The first of the six would be wrestler Hidekazu Yokoyama, who would be knocked out just after the 200 mark. Kobayashi would follow just mere sit-ups later, and Kuroiwa would run out of gas just after the 300 mark. This leaves three top athletes, a top-class wrestler, a world-class speed skater, and an Olympic gymnast. Shimizu managed to clock out at 384, which left Ikatani and Toita to battle for the win. But Ikatani would reach his limit at 424. This confirmed Toita as a champion again, but he wasn't done yet. He wanted to beat his record and reach that safety limit of 500. And he did he managed to clock in an impressive 500 sit-ups before being stopped, which gives us a climactic ending before the final battle. Piggybacking off the previous endurance events was our final and brand new event, Ghost Chair. I'm pretty stoked about this one because by some miracle, thanks to a TV special that aired 25 years later, some footage for this event survives. The rules are simple. 21 of the 23 competitors would sit against a wall, as if you were sitting in a chair, hence the name, and try to hold that position for as long as you could. It's basically one of those wall sit exercises, but in survival style format. One would assume that this would be a quicker event, as by the 5 minute mark, 16 remained, and at 10 minutes, that number was knocked down to 12. However, this progress soon began to stagnate, and it soon became less the competitors struggling, and more the commentator. A familiar face to some who may not know sportsmen, Ichiru Furutachi is famous for his interesting improvisations during his play-by-play. -play. He's been an announcer for almost 20 years by this point. And this is the event that stumps him. This is what he had to say about it. <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty bad. In fact, out of all 21 people, 5 people managed to make it past 1 hour, at which point they stopped. Probably because it was pure hell for the staff. 
An underwhelming end to the tournament, but not before Furutachi had a few words to say about the event, and some that weren't exactly nice. Only one week after Amateur 2 aired, a big change occurred on Kiniku Banzuke. Following the blowout success of Kiniku Banzuke's late night pilot, Tibia shifted the show to a prime time slot. Saturday, at 7 p.m. To further capitalize on the success, they started to bring in popular public figures alongside the public competitors, such as Yukio and Naoki Ikitani, who had both previously been on Sportsman Number 1. This season also featured a much wider variety of events, bringing in more Sportsman events such as Beach Flags and Monster Box. During this first season, Several episodes peaked with such high viewership, they ended up placing on the top 30 entertainment programs for 1995. By all accounts, Bansuke was a crowning success, and its success fueled more success for sportsmen in return. When Bansuke's second primetime season debuted in January 1996, a few unique events were created to continue to expand the variety seen on the show. Two of these in particular are notable, since they would later appear in the main sportsman tournaments. The first of these is Quick Muscle, a competition where two side-by-side -side competitors attempt to complete the most push-ups possible within three minutes. Although, let's just say that the quality and form of these push-ups doesn't matter much. The second of these was an upgraded version of Quick Muscle called Muscle Gym, also known as Triple Muscle Run in Japanese. Featuring a similar 3 minute format to Quick Muscle, competitors have to do 1 minute of sit ups, 1 minute of back extensions, and then 1 minute of push ups in quick succession. Allow me to take a moment to stray from the canonical numbered tournaments. For every tournament, there is typically a mini event usually dubbed a special battle. In the early days of Sportsman No. 1, these would typically air separately from the tournaments they represented. As such, the footage is scarce, as always. Nonetheless, this special was named the Monster Box Nippon Sports Science University Special. A mouthful, am I right? As the name could very subtly imply, the goal was to get a Japanese national to equal the record, which, again, was held by a Belarusian athlete. The Japanese record stood at 18 boxes, which was held by Yukio and Naoki Ikitani, as well as Yuichi Nakagaichi and Masataka Shirayawa. This lineup is also particularly interesting, considering a few of these guys would go on to compete in the Olympics. Oh. And also Sasuke. Not much survives, however, in terms of footage. It was very prevalent, however, that production had picked the perfect field for the task. 18 boxes was completed by all in attendance, which meant a national record was looking very possible. In fact, with minor struggles, only Yukio and Hikaru Tanaka would have their runs end at 19 boxes. Five athletes were made, and the prospect of tying the record was looking very real. On their very first attempt, Naoki and Kenichi would fly over the box with respectable airtime. While no one could join them on their second attempts, the two had made history, which is where the event would end. Following up on the Monster Box specials, a little less than a month later is the Women's Monster Box Championship, where as specified by the title, female competitors, gymnasts in particular, would go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Monster Box. It was notably held at the same venue as the previous Monster Box special. 
interestingly, it aired on three separate time slots in November of 1995, which is likely the reason why the footage that survives of this event starts at the tail end of nine boxes. Not much is missing though. Only what I could imagine as the worst Monster Box attempts to date. And also, figure skater Midori Ito getting eliminated. Don't worry though, things were cleaned up and we moved on to 10 boxes with 7 of our competitors remaining. Notably, competitors got second tries following at least the 8 box milestone a luxury competitors in Pro 1995 likely would have inked for. Did it make a difference? At the start, not particularly, as competitors were either down and out, or they would soar over the box effortlessly. We'll begin with volleyball player Motoko Obayashi, whose height is just 2 inches off the height of the box. Volleyball players usually tend to have the upper hand at this event due to their height, but not today it seems. This leaves us with just 6 remaining for 11 boxes. First off was Handball's Harumi Higa, with a painful tumble. Meanwhile, the gymnasts in the game, Risa Sugawara and Mari Kosuge, showed who the real pros were. As we move on to the second attempts, the only one left was Harumi Higa, the goal to not make the same mistake as before. Result? An easy clear. And as it turns out, she's the only competitor who isn't a gymnast. We move into 12 boxes, competitors the exact same as they were in the previous level. Higa had a much better attempt than her previous attempt, but it wasn't enough. She'll have to wait until her second attempt. Meanwhile, Sugawara runs on the start line and runs off it. As funny as this attempt might have been, she clearly was feeling the pressure at this point. She'll just have to hope that her second attempt is a lot better. In the meantime, Kosuge jumps and clears with relative ease. So, it's just Higa and Sugawara as our hopefuls in this second attempt. First off, was the handball player. Just didn't have enough height, and thus, she tumbles out of the competition. Meanwhile, Sugawara gives it another shot. And also can't get her timing correctly. Normally, this would be a fail for both attempts. But because she failed to touch the springboard in both attempts, Sugawara was put in an unprecedented situation. Third time's the charm. She managed to beat the nerves and was able to clear the 1 meter 96 box. Before going into the 2 meter territory, let's take a look at how we got there. ネットもしの摩天楼大林、大林元子、テレビのアナウンサー、この女装はどうだ。見事にこの8段をクリアです。ネット越しの摩天楼大林、大林元子、テレビのアナウンサー、この女装はどうだ。見事にこの8段をク
You know how in sports there's something that was clearly a foul? Everyone knows that it's a foul. The announcer, the competitor, everyone. And yet the referee looks the other way. You just witnessed it. Despite her clearly touching the box, both with her leg and with her hand, and even the competitor admitting it, the officials thought differently. Either way, that marks all five moving on to 14 boxes. Kawara Moto was the first to make her attempt, and she made a perfect attempt on the 12 meter 16 pyramid. While Risa Sugawara and Mari Kosuke chose to throw in the tower. But there is one person who takes their second attempt. Olympia Miho Shinoda, with her reason for attempting being. <laughs> a full thing to say, but it works. As we move on to 15 boxes, all three were unsuccessful. This was, in fact, the height of FOMI. But there was one who could clear it on their second attempt. Hiko Kawara Moda, a 22-year-old gymnast from Osaka, would now attempt the coveted 16 boxes mark. If you remember, this exact same level was barely cleared almost a year ago by baseball player Tatsuya Ida and gymnast Yukio Kitani. In a country that was still plagued by prejudice, this was a chance to break the stigma and show that girls could do just as well as the men. Her first attempt was less than successful, getting the distance but not the height, meaning she would have to rely on her second attempt. Could she do it? She won the tournament. I was unable to tame the beast that is the boss boss. She'll have to settle for 15 bucks. Or would she? Because as it turns out, they did another special a few months later. It's unknown exactly when this special happened, but she was 23 years old in this special, so it would have had to have been in 1996. 16 boxes, first try.自ら and it ends in a clear. Yukiko Kawara Moto matches the record set by the pro competitors and sets the record for women for years to come. Following the events of the Nippon Sports Special, they collected the two athletes who achieved the best result, both of which had tied the record at 20 boxes. The question, however, still remained. Was 21 boxes doable? Both of them, Naoki Ikitani and Kenichi Nagasawa, would join fellow record holder Vitaly Sherbo in what was referred to as the tense three-way monster box duel. The goal was relatively clear-cut. Achieve 21 boxes or die trying. It was the best of the best, so to speak. However, even for the record holders, they hit a sudden impasse at the 20 box mark. Vitaly, the first person to do it, shockingly was unable to do 20 boxes. The record holder being stopped dead in his tracks. Alas, it wasn't much better for the others. Naoki got 20 boxes by the skin of his teeth and soon tapped out after missing 21 boxes. Nagasawa met a similar fate. Though he was much closer, a simple miscalculation in his angle cost him a chance at the record. For the time being, 
the record would firmly stand at 20 boxes. The ratings of anything before mid-1997 aren't openly accessible, but it can be presumed that the first stab at a professional tournament was a fruitful one, seeing as on the 2nd of January in 1996, we'd find ourselves knees deep in another pro tournament. And since Yukio Tanaka no-showed Pro 1995, this would be our first title defense effort in the show's history, evidently from Tetsuya Ida. In addition to the six events listed off in the competitor introduction, we'd be teased with the inaugural Monster Box World Championships. Joining Ida would be 13 more athletes who do whatever it takes to win, as well as a special guest who we'll talk about when the time comes. Returning once again was Beach Flags, the first event of the tournament. It's actually in its proper place this time around. Nonetheless, the rules remained identical. It was four groups though this time around, due to the competitor count not being divisible by four, the groups were reduced to complement them. The first round was mostly straightforward, but things took a surprising turn in Group 3 when Tetsuya Kakeuchi and Yukio Ikitani dived for the same flag. Ikitani beat out Kakeuchi for the flag, and as procedure, he went for the other flag, and as he was aiming to grab, he overshot his hand placement, missing the flag. Out of nowhere, Yoshiaki Fujiwara came from behind to steal the flag from Kachiuchi's hands, turning what should have been a clear-cut peak into a surprising upset. The next few rounds were pretty straightforward as well. Suffice to say, Fujiwara's luck had run out, his competitors simply outdoing him at the game though he was a good sport about his loss nonetheless. <laughs> After round three, we had our elite four in Tetsuya Ida, Makoto Hasegawa, Yukio Ikitani, and Hitoshi Morishita, all of different talents. It was anyone's round. Evidently, Hasegawa and Ida had had quite a scuffle. Both men had gone for the same flag. While Ida was able to secure a flag, he had been trampled after being crushed by Hasegawa's body. As a result, he chose not to continue. Therefore, this would hurdle us straight into the finals. Kekenの勝ちでは完璧に池谷軍配が上がります。しかしスピード力でこの森下、さあ池谷か森下か運命の一瞬決勝戦。目指す旗はたったの一つです。Of course, with Yukio's biggest threat out of the game, the path to victory was concrete, and thus, the victory was his. This victory would send Yukio to an early lead with 150 points on the leaderboard. Up next was a staple event you likely saw coming, Monster Box. As you likely know, the overall world record from Pro 1995 had been torn to shreds long before this tournament could even happen, and thus, instead, focus was placed onto the professional athletes record, which still stood at 16 boxes. But luckily for our athletes, they were more or less familiar with the elements of play here. So the chances of a blowout like the last time were looking much lower. Sa, I don't think you must do that. Oh, the top! Or were they? 
Well, maybe that experience saved off the bloodbath. After the 11 box mark, only 3 were eliminated, compared to the 6 of last time. Even Yoshiaki Fujiwara, a competitor clearly not built for an event like this, was able to get a mark on the board this final round, before getting promptly eliminated at 11 boxes. Even though 12 boxes, again, went without incident, damage really started getting dealt by 13 boxes. Just above 2 meters, when the remaining field was chopped into less than two-thirds of when it started. By 14 boxes, the damage had added up and there was only 5 left. Thus, things weren't looking too bright. This is especially so when looking at Pro 1995 comparatively. Despite this, maybe things would turn up. Aside from the failure on Hideki Toyama's end, a particularly painful one at that, may I add, things were looking relatively solid. This is especially clear from Yukio's end, for instance. By 15 boxes, only four athletes remained. There were strong showings on the behalf of the few pro athletes that remained, but the idea of even tying the pro record seemed like a tough concept. Tatsuya Okabe would underperform on this level, failing on both of his attempts due to the initial springboard balance, being the only athlete to be eliminated on this level. 16 boxes, the current pro record. Three brave athletes remaining, could any of them tie the pro record? The man now leading the pack would be Makoto Hasegawa. He had given this event a solid run, but something alarming would occur as he would sustain an injury. Attempting to complete 16 boxes on his first attempt, visibly injuring his leg. While Otsuka and Ikitani were able to beat it without incident, the spotlight rose onto Hasegawa once again, who decided he'd give it another shot despite the injury scare. And... Hasegawa would complete 16 boxes on his second attempt. Despite his best efforts, Hasegawa would succumb to his injury, which was possibly exacerbated by his second attempt, and withdrew from the event. This put the event in an identical position to how it was last year, Yukio being joined by the lone remaining pro athlete Koji Otsuka. Koji went first. Could he turn the tide for pro athletes and make forward progress towards the record? No good. He'd have to give it another go. But not until Yukio makes his attack, of course. Yukio had been trained hard for this event. So 17 boxes was a trivial task by him. As soon as it was dashed, Cody's final opportunity to achieve the pro record was in his hands. What was it going to be? His foot had slapped the box. A silly mistake like that is all it takes to end your run. And then there was one. Yukio Ikitani stood alone. Having achieved the pro record, how would he fare on his lone crusade against the monster box? Of course, he was able to soar with 18 boxes as he did in March of last year. His demons were with what came after, 19 boxes. As the show itself calls back to, this particular level has been a giant roadblock for him, ending his run on two separate occasions. Would he finally make good on his training? Would this be the big breakthrough he's been anticipating for 10 months? He would have his 
first go at 19 boxes with a successful bounce off the springboard, but he narrowly failed to get past it with his rear hitting the top of the box. Tensions were high. With one final attempt, could Yukio be able to avenge past failures, or would he endure heartbreak once more? He flew into the air, but unfortunately, on the way down, his back hit the edge of the box. It was agonizingly close, but his attempts to beat his personal best came up empty once again. Still, this put him in an amazing spot on the leaderboard. The fruits of his labor giving him a handsomely large 130 point lead. But with this being an early point in the game, could he maintain that lead he worked so hard to grab? As we move on, our Brave 14 take on the returning tug of war. Like mentioned before, the event is exactly what it says on the tin. Just a simple game of tug of war that you do in great to. Again, this event was digested, but some notable events would be our first place competitor, Yukio Ikitani, getting knocked out on the first round, and returning event runner up, wrestler Yoshiaki Fujiwara, absolutely dominating in his heat. As we reach the semifinals, our two matchups are Yoshiaki Fujiwara versus basketball player Hideki Toyama and baseball outfielder Tatsuya Takeuchi versus karate fighter Masaki Satake. Now one can probably see where this was going to go, and you'd be partially wrong. Fujiwara used his weight to his advantage and won his heat, but Takeuchi had a swift lead after Satake slipped, making his way into the final. Fujiwara has the edge in terms of his weight, but can Kakeuchi hold him up and take it comes from behind the win? lasting around the end of the second part, and after Fujibar slipped, he was able to come back up strong, stealing the win for Kakeuchi's grip. 11th to join 3rd, and although the top 3 was mostly untouched, could this be a sign of things to come? Our fourth event was the 50 meter dash, and it turns out there's one competitor who will join the roster just for this event. Following Ida's victory in the previous year, fellow teammate Kenji Tomoshino has joined just to see if he can try and dethrone him, branding himself as a specialist of the 50 meter dash. This is what he had to say before entering. I don't want to win the first one. He actually competed in the first heat and basically dominated, finishing leads faster than the other competitors. Seriously? 11 seconds? Our second heat features Ida alongside Hideki Toyama and fellow baseball player Kazunori Yamamoto. Another easy heat, even managing to look back to see the competitors behind it. The third heat wasn't as easy as we saw another close race, a photo finish actually. It came between Tatsuya Takeuchi and Koji Otsuka. But it was Kakeuchi who took the win, by a difference of two hundredths of a second. In the semifinals, it's the race that everyone wanted to see. Ida versus Tomashima. 
Would Ida be able to defend his title, or would he be dethroned? It was close, and Tomoshino seemed to have the lead at first, but it was Ida at the end of it, with a time of 6.31 seconds. So, now the question is, who will join them in the final? For that answer, we turn to Tetsuya Kakeuchi and soccer player Hitoshi Morishita. And that doesn't happen often. A clear false start on Morishita's part, as his foot had just left the block after the signal started. You are allowed a false start, but would this make a difference in the race? Another close race, but Kakeuchi takes the win by eight hundredths of a second. What does he think of his run? Oh, defending champion, Ida not much confidence in the face of danger. With tensions high, who will come out on top as the winner? That was awkward. But perhaps help the nerves as both competitors are smiling. It wasn't even close. Ida manages to take the win for a second time by just over half a second. This takes Ida to second place and bumps Osuka down to third, while Kakeuchi is bumped up to fourth. I'm, however, Ikitane is still ahead of everyone else, though his knee continues to slip. You will never see a longer set of Power Force matches than what you will see in this tournament. The entire event was digested with a focus on how long they took. I would make fun of Higuchi for this decision, but considering half of the matches took well over three minutes, I feel like I would do the same. In fact, the longest match was between Alpine skier Tetsuya Okabe and cyclist Toshimasa Yoshioka, lasting 3 minutes and 45 seconds. I'll save you the time. Yoshiaki Fujiwara and basketball player Makoto Hasegawa. Fujiwara has a total of 18 seconds spread out amongst all the matches he did leaving an average of just 9 seconds per match. Make a note, Fujiwara was a seeded competitor, compared to Hasegawa's 7 minutes and 5 seconds in total, 2 minutes 22 for an average. This was almost destined to be an interesting match considering their records, but also because Hasegawa was almost 30 kilos lighter than Fujiwara. In the end, it was Fujiwara on the defense, as Hasegawa managed to hold him off for 2 minutes and 30 seconds before Fujiwara gave in. Ikitani, however, continued to make no progress on the leaderboard, so Hasegawa was able to take the lead by 30 points, Fujiwara not that far behind in 4th. Today's final event is a new event. Since Beach Flags got correlated to the beginning, something had to take its place. That something was the Gallandro. Another one that's just like what it sounds like. You pick up a 10 kilogram wooden barrel and throw it over a wall. Basically, if you've seen strongman events and you've seen people do the keg toss, that's basically the gallon. The wall keeps getting higher and higher until eventually either everyone fails or one person is on top. 
We begin at 4 meters. 11 attempted the event, and only 2 were unable to clear the first height. Tetsuya Okabe and soccer player Hiromitsu Isoda. It's important to note that in these first few heights we only get one attempt, similarly to how the monster box is done. The level that did more damage, however, was when the wall was set to the height of 4 meters 50 centimeters. For reference, and since this is the Sasuke community we're talking about, 4 meters 50 centimeters is the current height of the warped wall. Out of the 9 remaining, only 4 were able to clear it. These men were basketball players Makoto Hasegawa and Hideki Toyama, Yukio Itani, and baseball player Kazunori Yamamoto, who, by the way, did not earn a single point until this event. From the 5 meter mark, Competitors were given two tries at the event. Almost first, and he was able to clear it with ease. Toyama came next, but wasn't quite able to make it over the wall. Kikitani, the gymnast, was the shortest and lightest out of the field. So it might not come off as a surprise, but he with the height. Even the Wonder Kid, Kazunori Yamamoto, wasn't able to clear the wall, getting the height correct, but not the angle. However, all three had one last throw to try and prove themselves. Toyama, being first, did not disappoint. That now makes two over the 5 meter mark. But can we see another one? And this is where we reach a climax. Yukio Ikitani, who is in second, is trailing behind by a lot. So he'll want to make this throw to stay in the game and prevent Hasegawa from an outright win. Can he make it? He couldn't do it. Ikitani comes up just a meter short, and thus he is eliminated, and a winner has been decided. But an event winner has not yet been decided. The show continues on. Last up to the start line is Kintetsu Buffalo's Kazunori Yamamoto, who after getting no points has managed to find a second chance. Can the 38-year-old baseball player continue to press his luck? It just wasn't enough. So he ends the tournament in 12th place with 80 points. Only two basketball players remain, where they would go on to attempt 5 meters 25 centimeters, which is just a few inches above 17 feet and neither have the best luck starting off. So we move on to our second attempt. Can Hasegawa manage to clear the wall? He has the height, but his hands just slipped before he could get his angle correct. A very difficult to event, meaning it all comes down to Hideki Toyama. He's marked as being the first Japanese pro basketball player. Will he be able to show the pride of that title and defend his colleague? Miraculous throw! Toyama had done it, taking the event lead and setting the record for years to come. Overall, he takes fifth place, but of course, there were the final three. Third place was Yoshiaki Fujiwara, and second was Yukio Ikitani. Possibly the happiest I've ever seen someone to be runner up. Though, both first and second place got a car, so I can't exactly blame it. But of course, there can only be one person at the top, and that person is Makoto Hasegawa. He didn't necessarily do the best, 
but he got points exactly where he needed to. And that was enough to add his name to the Hall of Fame. However, you might be surprised to hear we're not exactly done yet. As it turns out, despite crowning a winner, we have a full 40 minutes left in the tournament. That's because it's time for a special. The staff have managed to get various track athletes from around the world. High jumpers, sprinters, pole vaulters, long jumpers, hurdlers, and one Naoki Ikitani. Our event begins at 13 boxes, but everyone cleared that with ease and they didn't show that part, so we'll begin with 14 boxes. Our event starts with possibly our most notable competitor in the lineup, Ukraine Sergei Bubka. Bubka is described as one of the best pole vaulters in the world. Becoming the first person to break the 6 meter 10 mark in 1991 and held a personal best of 6 meters 14 in 1994, a record which stood for almost 20 years. He managed to clear 14 boxes with ease. In fact, everyone either passed or cleared easily except for one person. New York long jumper Kareem Street Thompson. He had the distance, but just not enough height. Moving on to 15 boxes, there was one person who struggled with this level. Ukrainian pole vaulter and brother of Sergi, Vasily Babka. Unlike his brother, Vasily was not able to get a good jump and kind of just ended up on top of the box. On 16 boxes, we meet Javier Sotomayor, a man from Cuba who holds the record for the high jump at 2 meters 45 centimeters, set in 1993. He had the same problem as Vasily, not really getting a good jump on the springboard. Eight people remain out of the original 11 by the time we reach 17 boxes, just a centimeter above Sotomayor's high jump record. Sergi Bubka begins his attempt and didn't have the best of luck, missing his timing on the spring. Next was Scott Huffman, a pole vaulter from Kansas, and although it was uh, pretty close, he was able to clear 17 boxes. John Drummond, on the other hand, chose to pass on his attempt, and we move on to American hurdler Alan Johnson, who managed to also clear it with ease. New York's Derek Adkins, another hurdler, came pretty close but was able to clear it. The Cuban long jumper Ivan Pedroso wasn't as lucky. The Bahaman Troy Kemp passed on the level, and last up was Naoki Ikitani. It may seem like he's the odd one out, but he's one of the few to reach the world record at Monster Box 20 boxes. And as expected, 17 boxes was a breeze. But there were still two more that had issues with the level, Sergi Bubka and Ivan Pedroso. First off was Bubka. And not much had changed. Bubka was defeated, and relatively early on, and he wasn't alone, as Pedroso had done just about the same thing. 18 boxes is where our competitors started to hit a wall. Scott Huffman went first and came close on his second attempt, but had hit the box just at the end. Drummond, for some reason, tried to do it one footed and got a predictable result. And both Derek Adkins and Troy Kemp gave their attempt and got stuck at the top. However, there were two who were able to do it with relative ease Alan Johnson and Naoki Ikitani. Both come one step closer to the world record, getting the right to attempt 19 boxes. First off was Alan Johnson, the 110 meter hurdler from America. Alan Johnson, the time of the time. He's going to go out and 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 go
it seems like he might have set the springboard back too much, getting nowhere near the distance required. After him, of course, was Ikitani, the overall master of this event. And it showed. This put pressure on Alan Johnson as he reached his second attempt. If Alan clears this level, the challenge continues. If he fails, Ikitani's the winner. He clears it. He matches Ikatani in his own event. Here's what he had to say about it. Next, I'm going to clear the world record. Well, it'll be good, but... Uh... I don't know what to say about Tony. <laughs> so therefore, the event continues into 19 boxes. The two world athletes plunge into the world record, with Ikitani trying to defend his title. First off, of course, was the American hurdler, Alan Johnson. <laughs> 10 centimeters can change everything in an instant. The staggering 276 centimeters box was too much for him on his first attempt. But now, could Ikitani match his own record that he set just a few months prior? He makes it, but it wasn't exactly a walk in the park. He appeared to fear backwards, perhaps due to the pressure. Now, we reach the climax of our event. If Alan makes this jump, he punches the event to any of the record territory. If not, Ikitani becomes the sole winner. Can he do it? Barely any difference from his first attempt. Again, 10 centimeters can change everything, and he couldn't recover. But at the end of it all, despite coming from different sports, countries, and backgrounds, they all have one thing in common, sportsmanship. Allow us to take a quick detour as we discuss two tournaments outside of what we consider a core sportsman tournament. TBS wanted to continue to try and springboard off of the high amount of hype and ratings that Bonzukain Sportsman had been receiving, and so they decided to try and broaden the scope of content being produced. Their idea? to create a series of shorter sportsman tournaments that they could air irregularly within the Banzuke time frame that would act as a pilot of sorts for kickstarting additional content. You could argue these are similar to the special battle concept mentioned earlier, but these had the distinction of airing at an entirely separate time. Speed Sportsman aired only 25 days after Pro 1996, but it was not considered related to it or any other main tournament. These tournaments are largely forgotten, however. Format-wise, they hover a fine line between a special battle and an actual tournament. The names of these tournaments are the Speed and Power Battles. As implied, these tournaments majorly specialize in athlete skill sets, something sportsmen would somewhat try again, but it was never standalone like these tournaments were. So, to start, Speed Sportsmen featured a lineup of only five competitors, who I will show on the screen right here. Notably, everyone from the top three of Pro 1995's Beach Flags is here. This was, after all, taped a mere 13 days after Pro 1996. 
Kicking off this tournament was Dash, which was seemingly formatted much differently to how it was done in the pro tournaments up to this point. Qualifiers were conducted in a, well, qualifying based format, likely as a result of the downsized competitor pool. Everyone would go individually and the top two times would go to the finals. Third through fifth, on the other hand, would do one more race to determine third place, and then we'd get the finals race. That makes this rather easy to explain. In the qualifiers, Tetsuya Ida, already well known for cleaning house in this event, and Hiroshi Ide, a comedian. According to this ad, he was the proclaimed number one sprinter amongst comedians. A peculiar accolade, to say the least. In the end, it was a race heavily in Ida's favor. So, it's no surprise he won. Furthermore, he even improved on his personal best attack, dropping it by three hundredths of a second. This performance would net him 250 points, which is absolute lunacy to think about. Next is Beach Flags. Simply put, only one person would be eliminated per round. With the simplicity of the bracket system and the small competitor pool, you actually do get a decent amount of coverage involving the results. It took this long, right? Well, the results are more or less nothing to write home about. Once again, it came down to Ida and Ide, the same final two as the one in Dash. Suffice to say, history repeated itself, as Ida was the one who got the final flag and the point system was identical to Dash's. This put Ida at a whopping 500 points! For reference, the person in third place, Nobuki Rotakita, was at half of that, with 250 points. And finally, we have a newcomer event, and a bit of an iconic one at that. Its name is Shotgun Touch. This, this event needs no introduction. If you've ever even watched a sliver of sportsmen, but for those unfamiliar, competitors smack a button, run a set distance between the buzzer and the mat, and try to touch a volleyball before it hits said mat. The challenge is that you only have around 1.5 seconds between hitting the button and the ball hitting the mat, which in this case would be a failure. Also, I need to explain the rule set as it would vary between the types of tournaments. This tournament used what is now referred to as the Celebrity Rule Set. Essentially, competitors will pick a distance to wager their points, and they have three attempts or distances. Clearing or failing moves you to your next attempt. Another important thing to say is that before your third attempt, you must publicly say the distance you plan to attempt. Contrast your first and second attempts where you will write it on the card. Nonetheless, to say Ida was steamrolling the competition would be an understatement. To put it simply, it was over before it began. Especially after Ida, the only person that was even close to trailing Ida at this point, failed his second attempt. To finish things off, Ida would go for 12 meters, 50 centimeters which would be the new standing world record for this event. And... It was a close call. It'd have to go to review. It was within his fingertips. Ida had set a benchmark far above the others. In the end, Ida had 1,100 points. For reference, second place, Noble Hero Takeda at this point, had only 510 points. The prize information doesn't survive, but based on context clues in 
future tournaments, he probably got an undisclosed cash prize, likely around 500,000 yen. You can't have speed without power, right? Well, the producers certainly thought so. Not even a month after the speed battle came to television, the power battle followed. It's exactly what it says on the tin. Six competitors in mostly power-based sports faced off in power-based events. Most notably, judo player Chuck Wilson. Well known for what he did on television in the 80s and the 90s was one of them. Again, it doesn't differ too much from the speed battle, so in order to refrain from repeating myself, I'll keep this one relatively brief. The power battle begins with the aptly named Power Force. Contrast the speed battle, nothing footage-wise from this special has surfaced, which makes summarizing this rather messy. Ultimately though, let's just hop to the conclusion. Familiar faces Naoyuki Naito and Nobuhiko Takeda were both eliminated in the semifinals heat, which pitted football player Nachi Abe and wrestler Akira Ota against each other. As you may remember, Akira Ota had made it to the semis back in Amateur 2, however, this chance of redemption was snuffed by Abe as he took the win and got 200 points. Not quite as crazy as the speed battle. Next up was the yin to the yang of the two big power based events in Sportsman, the Tug of War, an event that some of our field has some experience with. For instance, both Akira Ota and Nobuhiko Takeda were competitors who have reached the finals in their respective tournaments. Hence why it makes sense that they made up the final two in this event. Ulta won his event while Nobuhiko lost to Yukio Tanaka back in 1993, so the odds definitely shifted towards Ulta, at least until Nobuhiko reigned supreme in the end. That rose Nobuhiko to second, 50 points within Ulta's lead. The final event was an event that had just been properly introduced earlier this year, the Gallant Throw. Unlike how it had been done earlier, its rule set functioned identically to its counterpart in the speed battle, Shotgun Touch. Anything from 4 meters up? Well, let's just say the sky is the limit. Suffice to say, things were looking a bit wonky in this one-time rule set. For those astute enough to keep track, the standing world record on Gallant Throw was just 5 meters 25 centimeters by Hideki Toyama. The first attempt was seemingly just competitors getting used to the motions, though something would go very wrong for our leader Akira Ota when he'd be unable to complete 4 meters 50 centimeters and the person trailing him, Nobuhiko Takada, was. This tied things up just in time for the competitor's second attempts, where we'd see our field take a stab at a new world record on our hands. Only Naoyuki Naito was successful, netting him a whopping 150 points for his troubles. Other than that, Ota's lead began to further deteriorate as Nobuhiko continued to climb up into first place. In the competitor's final attempts, Ota's fate now looked pretty much sealed, but some peculiar things began to happen. For starters, Nachi Abe tried an insane stunt, now trying to do 6 meters 10 centimeters. I can only imagine how people would have reacted to this, but it was all for naught as he failed, as expected. Meanwhile, Chuck and Naito tried the much more reasonable and achievable 5 meters 60 centimeters. Still a new world record, mind you. While Chuck came up short, Naito was actually successful once again, climbing into first place by 10 points. Unfortunately for Naito, 
all Nobuhiko had to do was just clear 5 meters again, and he'd take the lead right back. Suffice to say, this was an easy task for him, ending the event and the tournament right then and there. In the end, with 550 points, Nobuhiko Takeda was the winner of the power battle. I'd say he earned some well-deserved redemption for placing third back in 1993. A mere week later came 1996's first Monster Box special, but it wouldn't be like anything we had seen yet. For the first time ever, the event had traveled to the west, more specifically a beach in Los Angeles. The location in particular is pretty interesting because this wouldn't be too far off from where AW's earliest seasons would be taped. Amongst the field included stuntmen and actors getting their footing with their careers. Christopher Casso, for one, would appear in 1995's Batman Forever. Others were gymnasts who competed in this event as a small footnote to their careers such as gold medalist Mitch Gayward, a person that also appeared in the same movie. Oh, and also got a gold medal in the movies, nothing too crazy. Competitors were pretty comfortable at the start. The first eliminations only took place after 17 boxes, which proved that having fresh faces from the West was a fruitful operation. When we reached the world record of 20 boxes, we had an overwhelming five athletes that found their way to this point, and while two, Trent Dimas and Greg Curtis, were eliminated, that still placed three against the tantalizing prospect of a new world record. 21 boxes. Jim Foodie and Christopher Casso were both quickly outmatched by this new challenge, making it seem like the wait for a new world record would continue. But there was still one more athlete left, a 27-year-old gymnast named David St. Pierre. And what would happen was something magical. Having Americans compete in the Monster Box event had proved to be a great success, once again a foreigner claiming the record. And thus, we move on. Comparatively, a few days later we'd find ourselves in a rematch. Once again, it placed Japanese Nationals versus the Monster Box. The lineup including the Japanese record holders once again. Kenichi Nagasawa, and Naoki Ikitani. Amongst a few other competitors, TBS deemed to be fit enough to take on the record, all of them being young gymnasts. Odds were looking good. Failure only showed itself by the 19 box mark, just two levels under the record. But competitors quickly dropped off after that milestone, such a small distance making such a huge difference. As expected, however, it came down to the previous record holders Naoki and Nagasawa. And while Naoki again would come up short, Nagasawa had a more exciting outcome. The record had been tied! And with 22 boxes not yet being within the realm of possibility, it's time we move on once again. The show came back in the spring. Not for an amateur special, which by this point had been all but cancelled, but for a celebrity special. Yes. 14 celebrities, from actors to comedians, from idols to sports commentators, all going through six, with an asterisk, events. More on that later. Vying for that coveted number one spot. Taped on March 15th, 1996, before legends were born and names were known. 
This was the tournament that started it all. Our first event was an oldie, but a goodie, the Monster Box. As these were celebrities who, let's face it, probably haven't used one of these since elementary school, we start out at seven boxes, which was a height that was just a little bit taller than the highest level at that time. They were determined, but some weren't necessarily good, as comedian Lu Oshiba, for example, got too nervous and failed seven boxes, leaving no record on the board. By ten boxes, however, we were down to twelve contestants, and we were down to a strong 10 after 12. This is where problems began to emerge, however. Actor Shigeyuki Nakamura failed to complete 13 boxes, and actor Masaki Nomura couldn't solve 14 boxes. Both would soon become mainstays in the Colosseum. Soon, they had whittled the field from 10 to 6 to 1 as the only competitor remaining, dancer Kenya Asumi, had a chance to clear 15 boxes, which was around the height of an average phone booth in Japan. After failing it on his first attempt, he managed to pull himself together and make it count. He managed to clear 15 boxes, but there was one more looming record that he wanted to tie or break. The pro sportsman record. A celebrity being on par with pro athletes would be insane for the time period, as the celebrities still had some sort of stigma around them. But alas, Osumi was unable to break that barrier, making the official record for celebrities at 15 boxes. This put Osumi in the early lead. Following the travesty that was the final push-up, Higuchi decided to flip the idea on its head. Instead of seeing how many push-ups a human can do in general, he decided to focus instead on how fast humans can do it. Thus, Quick Muscle was born, an event where competitors must do as many push-ups as they can in 3 minutes. And the best part? They actually had rules this time. They had sensors at the top to make sure you were doing the push-ups properly. If not, they wouldn't count. And if you lost proper form at any point, you were out. That means you couldn't do this, this, or this. Doing this would result in instant disqualification. Singer slash actor Daisuke Shima did the best out of the 14, managing to do 77 push-ups, which set the mark for years to come. Another important thing to know is that this tournament implemented the elimination system, as after this round, two competitors would be eliminated. This was bad news for comedian Wu Oshiba, and former outfielder then sports journalist Hideki Kuriyama, as both did the worst out of everyone in Quick Muscle, and thus had the least amount of points. Oshiba had 16 points in total, to which I ask, how do you only do 16 push-ups in 3 minutes? And Kuriyama had 130 from his display of athleticism in the previous event, but unfortunately he had lost his composure in the last few seconds of his heat and thus scored no points. These two were the first victims of the Colosseum's strict rules. Next was another familiar favorite, Power Force. The book didn't disclose much so this will be brief, but Daisuke Shima and former cyclist Koichi Nakano made it to the finals. The whistle blew, and it was over within an instant, as Shima flew back. With a very close top three, and by close I mean within five points close, this shot Nakano up to third, Shima up to second, and Nomura, despite going out within the quarterfinals, had enough points to move into first place. It was anyone's game at this point. At the same time though, we said goodbye to four more contestants, knocking the field down to eight. 
The game continued with a new event called Dead Man's Drop. Basically, the competitor and their opponent are tied together with a taut rope and are standing on a pillar that's about 16 feet tall. Once the whistle blows, they'll have to pull on the rope using their hands, or really their body in general, to try and knock their opponent down. If both fall, the first competitor to fall is eliminated. Again, the book didn't really explain much, but just like the last round, Kenya Osumi fell in round one. In fact, the final four were virtually the same as the last event, just with actor Kisuke Yamashita swapped with talent Ryuta Mine. In the end though, it was Daisuke Shima and Masaki Nomura who battled it out. And the 43-year-old Nomura won. Save for Mine moving up from 8th to 4th, the leaderboard stayed the same. This does, however, mean that Kenya Osumi and actor Naoki Miyashita were eliminated. Before moving on, here's some backstory. So I said, originally, that there were six events, right? Well, technically, there were five. You see, by the time our competitors had reached Shotgun Touch, the competitors were mostly covered in injuries. Nomura, for example, had to have his thigh taped up after tearing a muscle. It was so bad that the doctors on set considered stopping the show altogether. But the competitors pushed to do one more event. So in order to prevent more injury, and likely to prevent Higuchi from being sued, the show stopped at Shotgun Touch and the final event was scrapped. That final event, if you were wondering? The Gallon Throw. Somehow, I feel like that wouldn't have gone well in these conditions. That means our six finalists are set. Shigeyuki Nakamura, Kisuke Yamashita, Ryuta Mine, Koichi Nakano, Daisuke Shima, and Masaki Nomura. They will all play a game new to mainline sportsmen called Shotgun Touch, where competitors must press a button and run and dive to catch a ball that's set 10 meters in the air. In this special, competitors get three attempts to do whatever distance they want, all with the intent of getting enough points to overtake the number one spot. The first attempt seemed to be mainly just try to get used to it as everyone took lower distances. But that didn't stop competitors from having issues. Kisuke Yamashita attempted 10 meters, 20 centimeters, and missed the button. Ryuta Mine attempted the same distance, and although he actually hit the button, he still failed to touch the ball. He later claimed that he had also suffered a muscle tear, and thus could not go on. Speaking of, Masaki Nomura had decided on a distance just 10 centimeters below that, and managed to barely clear it despite his injuries, keeping him in the running. But it was Daisuke Shima who did the best, clearing 10 meters, 60 centimeters, shooting him into first place. On the second attempt, Shigeyuki Nakamura was the first to break the 11 meter barrier, but was unable to clear it. Nomura attempted 10 meters 40 and once again barely managed to push through, but Daisuke Shima tried 10 meters 80 and managed to clear it with ease, keeping him in the number one spot. From here, it turns into a three-man race as we reach our third and final attempt. Whereas the previous two attempts were written on cards in advance, competitors would now choose their distance right before attempting. It's an all-or-nothing battle from here on out. Shigeyuki Nakamura once again chose to break the 11-meter barrier, and he finally did it, learning from his mistakes and failing to repeat them, confirming him in fourth place. Nomura, choosing not to injure himself further, attempted the same distance as last time, 10 meters 40, and survived yet again, taking him into second place. From there, Nakano was put into an interesting position. In order to stay in the game, he needed to attempt at least 10 meters 50, 
and to try and throw Shima off, he chose a meter more than that. 11 meters, 50 centimeters. He pressed the button, he ran and jumped, but he dived a bit too early and dived straight into the runway, killing his momentum and his run. And with that, the title was decided. But Shima still needed to make his attempt, and so he chose to challenge 11 meters 10 centimeters. This would ultimately get him the win not just in the tournament, but in the event as well. So with his last ounce of strength remaining, he ran and he dived, and was able to touch the ball. Daisuke Shima was victorious becoming the first celebrity champion and setting a bar to be crossed for years to come. And with that, the curtains close on a historic tournament. This next special was an interesting one. For years, people have considered it an amateur sportsman tournament when it wasn't really marked as anything, actually. Just a normal episode. But another name it's been called by is Olympian Special. Even though every amateur tournament is technically an Olympian Special in some way, this is what we're going to be calling this tournament for differentiation purposes. The reason why we're going to be calling it that is because this special features 20 competitors in total, with a total of 25 medals split between them. This special featured three main events with a historic special event that we will talk about later on. For now, here's the list of competitors that competed in the main events. Our special begins, at least editing-wise, with Power Force. The matches started out with Sprinter Satoru Inui, versus long jumper Carl Lewis. Lewis had the upper edge as he's vastly taller and heavier than Inui. However, he seemed to struggle a lot. And after almost a minute, it took Inui giving up for Lewis to be able to pull himself to the end. The next match should have been hurdler Kazuhiko Yamazaki versus 100 meter world record holder Donovan Bailey but Bailey was injured and decided to skip out on this heat, giving Yamazaki a bye into the next round. The third match was both against two hurdlers that competed in the Atlanta Olympics. 110 gold medalist Alan Johnson versus silver medalist Mark Creer. Almost instantly, Johnson struggled, and after a few seconds, he just kinda flipped backwards and gave Creer the win. The final match was between two people familiar to sportsmen, hammer thrower Koji Murofushi and 400 meter hurdle gold medalist Derek Adkins. Unsurprisingly, Murofushi has more power here, so he takes the win. This brings us to the semi-finals. Kazuhiko Yamazaki actually gets a match against Carl Lewis. And Mark Creer competes against Koji Murafushi. In the first match, Yamazaki seems to have an edge, but Lewis dives with an interesting technique and is able to regain ground. He should be fine because. <laughs> It took him two minutes, but despite that, he did indeed have his ass. The legendary Carl Lewis was in the finals. In the second match, they were about the same height, but Murofushi had the edge for weight, being 10 kilograms heavier. Against these odds, Creer seemed to have the edge for a bit but grew fatigued. Murofushi then took this chance to press the button on the other side, advancing to the finals round. We move on to the finals, and we have an intro I don't think they did before, and they certainly didn't do again. And I think it's best not explained, 
but observed. Carl Lewis. さあ、タイトルカールルイスの登場であります。左足を負傷しているにもかかわらず、右肩を負傷しているにもかかわらず、踊けるように入ってきたこの余裕の見せ方。35歳カールルイス。そして一方、カールルイスと戦うことになりました
ッシュは室伏がいい室伏がいい室伏がいったそのまま旗を取った室伏世界一を破った Koji had done it. He had knocked out the world's fastest man and had rolled his way into an even higher lead. The Monster Box special battles didn't stop coming, though anything in the past pales in comparison to what we witness here. For those unaware, this special event was taped during the 30th of July, smack dab in the middle of the duration of the 1996 Summer Olympics. Which were held in Atlanta, Georgia. The majority of the competitors that were enlisted, as such, had competed in the gymnastics events in the games. And there were some big names. The entire individual all around podium had showed up China's Li Xiaoshuang, Russia's Alexei Namov, and a familiar face by this point, Belarus's Vitaly Shurbo. With that said, there were also competitors like Yo Hong Sho, who placed 82nd all around, and David St. Pierre, who didn't even qualify for the Olympic team. But David did hold the record at 21 boxes, and Yo earned the silver medal in the vault. It was a big deal, and they intended on making it out as such. Look at this opening ceremony. The box started at 16 boxes, which was, at the time, the pro athlete record. To some, it was easy, but to others, it was not. Weirdly enough, failing 16 boxes did not grant you a second attempt, so failing here meant your run was over. Furthermore, Jury Chechi surprised the crowd by dropping out before he even made his first attempt, due to issues with his shoulder. Though this wouldn't be the only thing that turned heads. So, let's go! The Shosou's door! Oh, what? What did you do? This was not the best of Yosouda! In a possible attempt to showboat, Lee's legs touched the box, which meant quite possibly the biggest candidate to do well had failed instantly. He had placed first in the gymnastics all around ranking. The show must go on, however. By the time we reach 17 boxes, it's more of the same. Though Valerie Belenki had a similar sentiment to Chechi and also tapped out. To each their own, I suppose. Everyone else, except for Kipsamons, made it look very easy. I mean, just look at this airtime Yo got. By the time 19 boxes was all said and done, however, only three competitors remained to take on 20 boxes. Two record holders, and the second best vaulter in the world. Quite a considerable cut from the 12 we started with. As such, the stakes had reached their highest yet. All three, David, Yo, and Vitaly, all cleared 20 boxes. Yo and Vitaly cleared with relative ease, but David seemed to cut it close. Yo, meanwhile, said he was confident he could jump 22 to 22 boxes. In an instant, we were at the world record 21 boxes, which stood at 2 meters 86 centimeters. David went to try and match his own record, but came up short. Yo went second and was still able to clear the heats. Looks like he could be 22 to 22 boxes. Sherbo came last with his wife looking on. Even though his best was 20 boxes before this, he was able to break his record with relative ease. Someone who was still wanting to match his record was David St. Pierre, the current record holder. Down to only one try. He's put in a troubling position. Despite saying he wanted to correct his mistakes, his second run was more of the same, meaning that the Monster Box would have a new winner. 
But will it have a new record holder? We head into 22 boxes with Korea's Yo Hong Chol and Belarus's Vitaly Sherbo. With Vitaly saying this level is his last, it's do or die for the two. Yo gave his first attempt, but was unable to stay centered, hitting his thigh, causing him to turn around. Vitaly didn't have much luck either, hitting his back at the end of the box and plunging us into the second attempt. Yo went first again, but his hand slipped, grabbing onto the box, ending his run in an instant and leaving us down to only one. One last attempt. And almost blue. ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ、ドーナ
難しいですけどねいやとりあえず記録残したら勝ちですから<笑><笑>いや12で<笑><笑>いやこんなの言われてもねあおられても。<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> And actually came within a few centimeters. With Bailey out of the running due to injury, it was down to Mark Creer and Satoru Inui to beat the record. And Mark had a few encouraging words for Inui before his run. I'm going to go 12.60. 12 meters. Personal challenge. ボールと人間の妙味でやります。マーククリア銀メダリストどうだいったあーっと栗山君がボールに入れたのかこれまた微妙だこれまた微妙だ自ら運命を勝利の方に自分が吸引しようというような動きもう一度見てみましょう I hit that. I hit that. I hit that. アングルを変えてみるとどうでしょうか<笑>経験に祈るようなそんなポーズにも見えますさあここからですブーンあーすいませんけ触れてます。成功です。完全に距離は届いていた。He did it. Mark Creer had taken the world record and the lead, but not exactly the win. Mark Creer was only ahead by 90 centimeters. So realistically, Inui could clear any distance and win. So for Mark Creer to win, he would have to hope that Inui had taken him up on his challenge. Inoue 選手、距離はどうでしょうか ?70 で。70! 本当に12メートル70、勝負しますかはい、男ですからね。And he did. Satoru Inui decided to go for 12 meters, 70 centimeters. A risky, do or die situation. Considering how close he was in his last attempt, it all came down to the wire in this attempt as well. ジョナイが静まり返ったさあどうだダイブがどうだこれは静まり返ったさあどうだダイブがどうだこれは微妙なところだ瞬速を利してそして最後は低空飛行うわっああボールの方が先に設置しております Unfortunately, Inui still came up short. So Mark Creer was the one who was victorious on Shotgun Touch. However, ultimately, it wasn't enough to detract from Koji Murakushi's monstrous lead, who had the most points overall and therefore took the win and the car in one of the most under acknowledged wins ever. 1996 was perhaps the most erratic year in sportsman's history, but things would start to cool down as we reached 1997. Of course, with the advent of a new year came a new pro sportsman tournament. One comparatively low key. One more competitor would compete this time around compared to 1996, bringing our field up to 16. Though surprisingly, Defending champion Makoto Hasegawa, nor runner up Yukio Ikitani, were in attendance. 
making its pro sportsman debut, Dead Man's Drop was the first event of this tournament returning from the first celebrity survival battle. Something you'll notice is that a lot of this event was fast forwarded. After the first heat, we'd enter a long-winded digest which would span the entire first round, ending with Yoshiaki Fujiwara winning his match while throwing the entire sportsman idea for a loop. Once again, the second round would start with Kiyohara's match once again, ending with his loss, and the entire round was fast-forwarded. Again. Not long after the event had started in the broadcast, it would be time for semi-finals, our final four being decided. Suffice to say, Masaki Satake and Koji Akiyama were able to get the upper hand on their opponents, which would set the stage for the finals. The build-up to the finals were longer than the actual final itself. As soon as the whistle would blow to start the event, within two seconds, it was all over, with Koji Akiyama ending the event in supersonic speed. Such a success would earn him 20 points. The point system for this tournament was particularly strange, even for early sportsman standards. Despite the odd point system, he would be at the top of the leaderboard as results stood. Dash made its return with quite a few fan favorites in the event, all of them looking to take down Tetsuya Ida, the man no one could outrun. To summarize, he had gone the past two pro tournaments unbeaten. Victory wouldn't come so easy this time around, however. Both of the runner-ups Ida had defeated were in attendance. Unfortunately for one of them, Tetsuya Kakiuchi, he was pitted in the first heat. You know who else was in the first heat? To add to his staggering victory, Ida even improved upon his own record, lowering it by a one hundredth of a second. Nobuhiro Takeda, Pro 1995's runner-up in this event, was placed in a heat that seemed decently in his favor, but a baseball infielder by the name of Chihiro Hamada quickly broke away with an impenetrable lead and shattered the likelihood of him returning to the finals. After the third heat that included outfielder Tomohiro Jo pulling the rug from beneath a FIFA World Cup player, Basaki Sawanobori, there was one heat left. For the failure that came from our past, a fresh face rose up. Baseball shortstopper Kazuo Matsui. Just like Ida in his first tenure of success, he slowed down just before the finish line. Maybe he too was holding back. But he had somehow snatched the record by another hundredth of a second. An incredible statement having been made. He wasn't even at his full power. Just like that, it's time for the semi-finals, an all-baseball field. Not much is important to say here, but it predictably fell into the matchup we had all been waiting for, as Havana and Joe were promptly eliminated by the strongest runners we had seen yet. Ida had taken the pro record back with a 6.14, but not long after, Matsui had snatched it back with a 6.11. Things were getting heated, and soon it was time for the final showdown. Tetsuya Ida versus Kazuo Matsui. The question would be answered. What happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? A false start. Ida's confidence may have been shaken by such a powerful opponent. He had noticed Matsui would ramp up in speed as the race continued, and thus the best feasible option for him was to have the perfect start. The race would start again, but there would be no third chances for Ida. If he false started again, he would be disqualified.
ピーンと張り詰めた緊張感今度は綺麗なスタート飯田が飛び出すがいや松井だ松井がターボエンジンをかけた松井がターボエンジンかけて勝ったー6秒0 7 6秒0 7驚異の記録で松井が優勝飯田の三連覇ならず Even with Ida's rocket start, where he pulled ahead for a brief moment, Matsui was able to fly ahead and took the win, much to his satisfaction, with a mind boggling 6.07 seconds on the clock. Rather than the traditional Monster Box event, we got something a little different in between the two events called the Monster Box Japan series. The goal was laid out on the table rather quickly. The professional record still a meager 16 boxes from the first proper sportsman tournament had eluded being broken for two years by this point. To break the record, they got the three best professional athletes to do the job. The only pro athletes who had completed 16 boxes, Tetsuya Ida in 1995. Koji Otsuka in 1996, and the reigning champion Makoto Hasegawa, also in 1996. Were any of the men apt to the task, the event would get straight to the point and start at 15 boxes. Evidently, it was easy for all of them, even though Ida had a bit of a close call. As expected, the three men quickly reached the end all of progress for professional athletes. 17 boxes. 2 meters, 46 centimeters. To get past this point, they would need to take everything they had learned, all their experience, and then some. Hasegawa stepped up first. No good. Otsuka came next. A little closer, but no cigar. Ida! The person who had scraped by before was seemingly deposed to the same fate until. Just barely, he had flown by the top of the box. Maybe it was his technique, but nonetheless, he was through. Victory wasn't sealed just yet, though. Hasegawa and Otsuka still had their second attempts. But what happened next would be a shock to the small crowd when Hasegawa was unable to clear the box. The reigning champion had been defeated. Would this be it for Otsuka? If the reigning champ couldn't do it, could a mere baseball outfielder? Well, he joined Ida by finagling his body over the box. And thus, the two men stood before a daunting prospect 18 boxes. The record was a reality, but it was evident neither had been prepared for such a task. Swiftly, they were both eliminated, not even getting close to clearing. But both Otsuka and Ida had made history. Making its return once again is the tug of war. Editing for this event is really scatterbrain and places emphasis on some select competitors while outright cutting others. But I'll cover it the best I can. The event began with Kazuhiro Kiyohara vs. Tomohiro Jo. If you don't remember, Kiyohara last competed in Pro 
but came up short and landed in third place, as he was eliminated by Yoshiaki Fujiwara, the current tug-of-war reigning champion. So, he had a score to settle with Fujiwara. He was a face to fear as he effortlessly pulled the rope in both round 1 and 2 and flew into the semis. For Masaki Satake, it was a similar story and he too cruised his way to the semifinals with relative ease. Yoshiaki Fujiwara had drawn a spot that allowed him to skip round 1 due to the uneven player amounts. Though it didn't matter as the man he faced, Tetsuya Ida, was pulled across the canvas easily. The only round 2 match left to talk about by this point is Tetsuya Takeuchi vs Satoshi Takahashi, and I'll let this one speak for itself. It was an absolute nail biter. Even fellow competitors were amazed by the sheer perseverance from Kakiuchi. It was time for the semifinals, and four competitors were left standing. The first match would be a familiar one Fujiwara versus Kakiuchi. If you can believe it, this was the decisive final matchup last time, and it ended with Fujiwara's victory. Alas, this time around, Fujiwara was quickly able to break his grip, and the match ended within seconds, despite Kakiuchi's resistance. Nonetheless, Fujiwara was back in the finals. The only thing left before the finals would commence would be to decide who would join him. It was Kazuhiro Kiyohara, versus Masaki Satake. Comparatively, it was a much longer match. Satake desperately trying to cling onto the rope, taking it back. But once Kiyohara began to get into the groove, it was over. From one rematch to another was one two years in the making. Kazuhiro Kiyohara was face to face with the man who ended his run back in 1995 Yoshiaki Fujiwara. The tension began mounting. とりあえず同じ土俵に立てる。そうですね。約2年待ちました。ま、自分はそんな絶対負けないとおっしゃっておりました。今の集中力は結果がね、今ぶち切るそうですよ。Would the training pay off? Would Kiyohara find himself as the number one? At the beginning, Kiyohara had a burst of energy that would make even the cool Fujiwara sweat. But just as quickly as he pulled ahead, he lost it in a fierce back and forth, giving Fujiwara the win for the second year in a row and pulling him from 8th place to 1st place by 5 points. By this point, we reach Shotgun Touch, which until this point had appeared in seemingly every series, except the Pro Tournaments. At this stage in the tournament, it's anyone's game, with anyone in the top 8 being within climbing distance of being a possible champion. Nonetheless, this event would be the equalizer for what was a rather even leaderboard. But things would take a sudden turn when the competitor who utterly cleaned house in the speed battle, Tetsuya Ida, would drop out at 11 meters 50 due to feeling uncomfortable with his legs. This was the second consecutive such incident Ida has had, and you have to feel bad for the guy at this point. The event had to continue though, and continue it did. While every other competitor was eliminated by 12 meters 40, baseball infielder Kazuo Matsui was far from done. By the time he was the sole remaining competitor, Mark Creer's standing world record of 12 meters 60 centimeters was appearing in real danger of being broken. So, he gave it his best shot, and... Oh,
この距離を見ることによって次がおっと指が触れているかこれはあまりにも速すぎて錯覚したのかもう一度見てみましょうものすごいダイビングだこっからだいぶ滑空に入りましたそして触ってません残り1センチ弱 It was a rare misstep in what had been a perfect run up to this point. Matsuri was down. He was far from out. He had a second try still, so with everything he had, this is what he did. In one fell swoop, he had clutched the world record in a whopping three points. Despite this being a decent stopping point, he kept going. Even though he took two attempts on 12 meters 70, he cruised through 12 meters 80 and 12 meters 90 easily. Was that misstep just a freak accident? All of it was just clockwork to him. Before he knew it, he had entered the 13 meter territory. If he could succeed in diving for the ball, he would up the record by 40 centimeters, or about 15 inches. So he went for it, and thus, this is what happened. 前人未到の距離に挑んでいきますさあどうだ松井ボールが落下するおっとこれは売れていないか VTR とスローで見てみましょうどうだ触れている小指小指が触れた13メートル He got it Despite the misstep at 12 meters 70 He had really carried the weight As a result, this performance of dominance had essentially cemented Matsuri the win. The others in the field weren't even competing for first anymore. They were competing for third. With Matsui essentially giving himself the win on Shotgun Touch, it would take an absolute miracle on the final event, the Gallon Throw, for him to not win at this point. All that's important to know is that three people Baseballers Kazuo Matsui, Kazuhiro Kiyohara, and Tetsuya Kakiuchi were facing the new world record 5m30. Matsui fell just short of the top of the board, though this didn't matter, of course, while Kakiuchi and Kiyohara were able to throw the barrel over the board. Kiyohara failed soon after that, ending his tournament overall in 5th place, and Kakiuchi. Continued to throw up until the 5 meter 70 mark, where he called it quits after that and cemented third place. But in the end, it was Kazuo Matsui who took the game and ran with it. Despite not winning in the first and third events, he made record breaking attempts where it mattered, and he ended his tournament with 69 points, a 22 point gap from second place. And as always, going home with a pretty cool car. Before we move on, this is what number one Matsui had to say about his victory. やっぱ1位になりたいなとかそういうふうに思ったんですけどやっぱこれからまあ来年再来年度が続きますけどそれにぜひま出していただいてまあその1位をね維持できるように頑張ってきたと思います今日は本当にありがとうございました道の領域3メートル6センチ23段にセットされております。中を抜いていきました大隅健也。おっと野村が動き始めた。中村茂雄29歳90回。90回に手が届いた。低い状態からプッシュ1番取る。
かどうかに勝っております。